Imagine being addicted to meth and heroin before you were even born. An addiction so intertwined within every fabric of your being that your life is seemingly decided for you before you've exited the womb. You're an addict before you take your first breath, before you open your eyes, before you can even cry out to the world for help, if that help even exists. This is Coco's story, the story of a baby born fighting every odd that was placed against her, the story of resilience in the form of a few pound infant whose mother faced housing insecurity, poverty, and addiction, whose mother had no choice but to give her to the state social welfare system so that maybe, just maybe, she'd have a chance. Moments are powerful things, like the moment a mother makes a heart-wrenching and selfless decision to let her only daughter go. Like the moment another mother, my mother, delivered Coco and chose in the same week to take this baby home to her other daughters, to my family. In a moment, Coco's life would change forever, and in that moment, so would mine. In that single moment, I'd begin learning how to take care of a newborn who was actively withdrawing from meth and heroin. The day Coco came home, I sat with her in my lap, tears streaming down my face. I felt fraught with the reality that here was someone whose odds were against her since before she was even able to take her first true breath of life. In the months that followed, I held Coco during Zoom classes, just out of the frame for hours at a time. Knowing skin contact was essential for infants separated from their birth mothers and learning how to respond to immediate signs of withdrawal, I felt something indelibly leave a mark on my life. During our COVID year, Coco rested in my arms while I graphed logarithmic equations, gazed up at me as I went into breakout rooms, and changed my Spotify rap list when the Arctic Monkeys and Lana Del Rey were replaced with Coco Melon and Baby Shark. I began to imagine a world where I was born in the wrong circumstances, where fate created an addiction before I had even opened my eyes. I sat with our family social worker every week, listening to the story she told me about her cases and wondering how many more Cocos there were out there. Day by day, Coco defied the odds, gaining strength, dexterity, and cognitive functioning in ways one doctor, without hesitation, told us would never be possible. It's strange to think how something so small can plant a seed that sprouts so large, reaching places you'd never thought you'd go before. During the first Nauru's my Persian family celebrated with Coco, I remember preparing the half scene, sprinkling the wheat seeds into a bowl where, in days, grass would sprout. Every morning, Coco and I watered the sabze together, and in three days, Coco squealed as her little fingers brushed through the sprouted green. In that moment, I couldn't help but think about how, like the AIDS celebration itself, I was witnessing a rebirth, both a new life for Coco and a newfound realization within me. Coco's presence in my life had taught me the importance of nurturing the small things and the value of believing in something far bigger than myself. At the beginning of the Iranian New Year, when spring was arriving, so had a part of me that would be nourished by a tiny little girl from the NICU. I'm only 18 years old, but when I look back on my life, I know that there is no more important moment than the day that Coco came home, teaching me that miracles can sprout even in the most unforgiving of environments. Coco gave me hope that would catalyze my own development. Coco's fight became my fight, and that fight showed me firsthand how many Cocos there are out there in the world, how many foster youth will age out of the system and end up with PTSD and no supportive families. As I worked with social workers from the Department of Child and Family Services and the Guardians of Love Foster Agency, I knew that the moment Coco became my sister would ignite something far bigger than I could truly put into words. Coco was our family, but what about the 407,000th 
1,000 foster youth who don't have permanent families, who are told they have a one in five chance of becoming homeless when they turn 18. What about the 70% of female foster youth who are likely to become pregnant before age 21? What about the mere 97% of foster youth who don't earn a college degree? What about the one in four foster youth who don't graduate high school or get a GED? A 2022 report by the Federal Child Welfare Information Gateway reveals that in a single year, one third of foster youth are placed in more than two homes. And here in Los Angeles, nearly 50% of those children will be displaced three times or more this year alone. Take a moment to let that sink in. Imagine your stability depended on a state welfare system that was under-resourced, and your home depended on whether or not strangers wanted to open their doors and hearts for you. This is the story of foster youth. This is Coco's story. But really, it's part of such a larger story, larger than you or me larger than my family or our state system. It's the story of displacement, of abandonment, of neglect, the story of how we as humans cannot ignore the stark realities of the world around us. I was moved by meeting an infant who was part of a much larger story, and in doing so, started a nonprofit foundation with the help of my community, the Guardians of Love Agency, the Los Angeles Mission, and the Department of Child and Family Services. It was a foundation that I put my heart and soul into, knowing how many children wouldn't have the same opportunities and resources that Coco did by becoming my sister. Founding Coco's Angels and putting on back-to-school drives, book fairs, youth tutoring programs, and holiday events, I felt a sense of purpose, a sense of fulfillment in knowing that my story had all began in a single moment I refused to look away from the truth. The truth of it all is that this is not just Coco's story, nor mine. This is the story of those who cannot help themselves, but more importantly, it's the story of those who can help those who cannot help themselves. This, my friends, is your story. Children without permanent homes, welfare agencies that lack resources, epidemics of housing insecurity, poverty-stricken communities without healthcare access. There are countless ways that these stories can become your story too. I remember the day that Coco took her first steps, defying every prognosis that doctors made about her development. It was a milestone, of course, but it was an also an a moment that affirmed for me that everything we were doing for this community was worth it. The moment you look at the world around you and you see something that is wrong with it, that is the moment that matters most. It's the moment you might not know how to fix it, but you try anyway. Something small like starting a fundraiser, like volunteering at a soup kitchen, engaging in a conversation with someone who asks you for money on the street. It's about seeing these individuals and communities not as problems, but as humans, as reflections of ourselves, as opportunities to enact empathy and exercise change on the micro level. If every person did it, the micro becomes a macro. And even if you don't know how to solve the big problems of our world, at least you've taken a moment to try to help in a way that you singularly can. Coco taught me that in the right environment, anything is possible. In the right moment, change is not impossible, but instead a long path we must choose to embark upon together so that we can right the wrongs that exist in our very communities. Maybe you don't have a cocoa, or at least you don't think you do, but the reality is that we all have a cocoa in our lives, a person or community that needs us to take action, to find compassion, and to start to try to change that person or community's life forevermore. 
you don't have to start a nonprofit or foster a child born addicted to opioids. You don't have to move mountains and cross the world to find your own cocoa. Chances are, in your hometown, maybe even in your neighborhood, there is someone who needs you. Someone who needs you to take a moment and ask yourself what you can do to help. It's a simple question, really. A question we too often forget to ask ourselves in the midst of our busy lives. But it's a question we can all find the answer to when we look in the right places. Coco's story, my story, the story of foster youth, and your story. Here, now, they intersect. Imploring you to ask what you can do in a moment to make a difference in the world around you. And in doing so, you begin to learn the transformative power that a single moment potentially holds. So, today, I want you to ask yourself what a moment means to you. What any moment can mean. The answer? It means everything. If only you take a moment to simply try. Thank you. Thank you.